Well, good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here for the football show on our game on this Thursday morning, uh, ahead of a big Tolchin Cup semi-final weekend. Delighted to be joined by awfully legend Carl Daly. Carl, how are you this morning? Great now. Thanks very much, Michael. Good man. Uh, looking forward to the weekend, Carl. Obviously, the, the inaugural Tolchin Cup, we're at the, the semi-final stage. How do you feel it has, it has, it has been received by players, by the public? Uh, I know... Chatting to people is only looking like there's going to be about 8,000 people up in Crow Park on Sunday. I suppose, number one, do you agree with the games been in Crow Park at the semi final stage? And how do you feel it has been received by the public so far? Uh, I suppose Crow Park, uh, yeah, I don't agree with Crow Park. Could you imagine Offaly Westmead in either Tullamore or Mullingar? Um, I think there'd be a huge crowd going there this weekend if that was the case on everyone's doorstep. and. Either team would love to go across the, the ditch and, and beat the, the, the rivals and, and head off smiling. So to bring it up to Croke Park and in a big empty stadium, I think the atmosphere might suffer as a result. Just talk to me a bit about that. Um, unless you're from either Offaly or Westmead, you probably just don't know. I don't know if bitter is the right word to use. It's a, it's a good, healthy rivalry. But uh, talk to me about the, the rivalry between the two counties and any particular memories from your own playing career playing Westmead because Lord knows you played them enough times. Yeah, we played them a good few times and it was always tight. Number one, no matter how well we were going or no matter how poorly we were going, those games were always tight with, with ourselves in Westmead. Um, I suppose in Tullamore you have Kilbegan, you have a few, you know, a few turns past around the border there with us and they, they come across some of us would have been in school together. So straight away, you know yourself being on the, the awfully tip border there, lads coming across into Bor, you know, that straight away adds to everything. Everything you do then, you don't want to be beaten by the fella that you were in school with. You don't want to be beaten by the fella that's just out the road that comes into shop in Tullamore. You want to nail that down and get one up on them because, you you know, and as well as that, maybe for a while there in Offaly, we probably thought we were a cut above Westmead and now the shoe is kind of on the other foot. So it, it, it's not simple at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Just talking about that, I don't know, were you still involved when PJ Ward uh, jumped the fence and came into Offaly, which was a unique situation, I'd say, too? No, I wasn't. Uh, I had just finished with Offaly at that stage. Um, would have came across PJ in club football all right, when he was playing for Shamrocks. Um, but no, no. I um, personally didn't agree with it. But look, that was that was PJ's decision. He probably, you know, he wanted to play inter-county football and he, he got that shot with Offaly and he came and you know, he added to it for the, the, the little while he was there. But for me, coming seven, eight kilometres in the road and changing a county allegiance doesn't sit right. Just, you know, the, you know, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be for me anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, just, just looking ahead, head to the game at the weekend. Offaly season could have probably petered out um, after the defeat to, Le- to Wexford in the Leinster Championship, beaten by a point. That was a bit of a, disa- a, bit of a disaster of a result, really. Uh, or they were beaten by a couple more, I should say. They ended up turning it around and beating them in the first round of the Talchin Cup. I suppose you'd have to be pleased with how things have turned or, turned around because the wheels probably could have came off there and our season could be well over at this stage. Yeah, it was very, very, very close to the wheels coming off and it would have been a really, really poor end to a, a season where we started out in Division 2, you know, looking at the 20s coming through, a little bit of excitement around the place to getting demoted back down to Division 3 and getting knocked out in the first round of Leinster then going and by the skin of our teeth scraping across the line in the first round of Talton. But since then, to be fair to everyone, management players, they've really kicked on and they've embraced the competition, which awfully in the qualifiers years gone past and definitely in my time when we were playing we didn't embrace it as a group. Maybe there was a handful of us uh, wanted it, but most of us, as soon as we were out of Leinster, as soon as we, we, you know, that was kind of throw your hat at it and walk away and wait for next year. But these boys have knuckled down and, you know, injuries have been a problem. It, we, it looks like Nile Derby, even as late as this week, has gone down. So, But they've still met all those obstacles and overcome them and driven on, which is to their credit in a big way. 
Yeah, Niall Darby that you mentioned there is that I think he's understood to have suffered a, the cruciate injury, which is, uh, you know, that's a, a disaster. It's at least nine months, and mean he missed the rest of the county campaign and probably the club campaign at Road as well. I wish him uh, the best wishes. Obviously, a stalwart there. He's been there for the, the goods of the last decade. Um, just on that, when you in your own playing days, was it just once Leinster was gone that there was a realistic chance of you know winning a title gone or why why do you think the mindset shifted after when you went into the qualifiers yeah i think i think that was it really you know you, you look at if we're not good enough to win leinster well how are we going to win in all ireland that was maybe and it's sad to say it really we should have you know we should have really been a lot more professional and a lot more hard nosed about it and gone after those qualifiers because you look at back in those days Fermanagh went on big runs Leash went on good runs uh, uh, who I think Westmead went on a good run one year so for for us not to to take that challenge on and go for it is is probably a disappointment looking back on it and and just on that um the way the Talton Cup has been received in that way and that the lads have gone gone for it straight away. That's a really... And to be fair, I, I don't think you could pick out any squad that hasn't really taken it seriously, which is... And the vibes are that managers are given and players are given are all very positive. So on the flip of maybe a team going out 10 or 15 years ago out of their province and not thinking that they have a realistic chance of winning something, at least they're going into something now that they think they have a realistic chance of winning at something where... I suppose anybody could be ge- be beating another team on any given day as well. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, look, I think initially at the outset, people were terrified that this Talton Cup was going to be another Tommy Murphy effort, uh, and you're going, you know, it was just going to peter out into a nothing kind of competition. But uh, the pressure was on the GA to make it work, and to be fair, uh, and I know they're probably trying to do the right thing by bringing them to Crow Park. But to be fair, it has been a, a success up to this point. So, um, I'm, and I'm delighted for the lads. They're getting, you know, they're getting really competitive games in a good environment uh, where it, they're they're able to express themselves. And it's not two games and gone, you know. And that's what particularly this awfully bunch with with a lot of young fellas coming through. They need that. They need that for next year. And the the bounce that we could get from doing well in this, getting to a final, which is going to be a tough ask against Westmead, but we still have to think we can do it. But to get, you know, get to a final and maybe win some silverware, the bounce for next year could be huge. Yeah, hundred percent. As you say, there's a there's a good handful of under twenties playing at the moment between Jack Bryant, Lee Pearson, uh, Morgan Tynan was in the last day. And there's probably a couple of more lads as well. It is a very good foundation for those kind of guys to get a good taster of what senior intercounty football is all about and get better year on year. At least they're not being thrown in against, you know, a first round qualifier against, you know, a Mayo or something like that, where you obviously learn an awful lot, but you probably get a bit demoralised potentially as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're not ready for that level, and I think with with the, the, the under-20 championship coming back from under-21, phys- the physical development of a lot of these senior teams now is light years away from where it used to be, and then you're coming in a year younger, you know, I know myself, I was never the biggest, so I could just imagine that jump now for some of the lads, it, it, like, it, it's just huge, you know, and, and the other side of it is, even with all those young fellas that you have named, there's end, there's another handful of those under 20s that have suffered a lot of injuries since that hectic year last year. You know, I'm, I'm thinking a couple of my own club men in Cormac Egan and John Furlong and, and uh, Oshin Keenan Martin now. Like the three of those guys have really sustained serious injuries as a result of of the, the huge load they had last year. But they're not getting, they would have been in the fire line for this competition and would have benefited from it greatly if it wasn't for those injuries. But that's another probably topic for another day. Uh, well, we, we might just b- briefly touch on it now. It is a difficult balancing act. And um, I know this was probably one of the reasons why under 20, uh, under 20 players aren't allowed to play. You can't play under 20 and senior championship. How difficult that balancing act has obviously been a bit on balance with, with a couple of players. Obviously, Cormac ended up missing uh, Tullamore's county final win last year as a result of an injury they picked up. And then I think it was a, a similar type of an injury, a uh, hamstring injury again this year. There's a lot of balance um, and a lot of coordination between a lot of people needed to make sure that the player is put first and all this. Yeah, he does his, he does all his S&C and all, his, as you know, he, he trains regularly. 
but that he trains smart also and that we see a kind of a longer term or a bigger picture in place for these lads. Yeah, definitely has to be player based or centered, whichever, you know, whatever phrase you want to use. And the lads that I've mentioned, you know, they're they're gonna miss the guts of a year now, which is is very unfortunate. And at, at that age, that's where the big jump is made. Like you from 18 to 21, that's where you, you make the huge leaps uh, in terms of, of stepping up through the braids. So for them to miss at, at a very vital time in, in their development is is hard is it's hard for awfully, but it's it's harder on the lads, really. Yeah, no, it's very difficult. Then you would have had, you've uh, would have had all the, most of those guys at minor level as well. Carl, you've been involved for I think the last three years with the minors. You were the uh, you were involved in that twenty twenty Leinster final that was delayed, where you were beaten uh, beaten agonisingly by Mead, unfortunately. Um, how do you find getting involved in the coaching world now? Initially, I could take it or leave it. To be honest, um, I suppose when you're you know you play for X amount of time and you build up a lot of friendships and contacts that when somebody does come asking, it's hard to say no. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it wasn't on my bucket list to, to turn into a coach when I finished playing football and I had a bit of a time out where that didn't happen. But now now that I'm involved, I really enjoy it. Um, yeah, no, it's it's good fun. And that minor setup, you know, there's great fellas involved and, and we all have our say and we all have our disagreements. But as a group, it's a brilliant place to be. It's a brilliant environment. And we try our best. We try our damnedest to put whatever team that's in front of us out there onto the field as bestly prepared as possible. Uh, even this year, getting us both to a Leinster, a Leinster semi-final, every team is not going to be good enough to contest a Leinster final. It's just a matter of, I suppose, developing those lads and getting them to a certain level. Every team can't, won't be good enough to contest a Leinster final. Um, but it, it, being competitive and remaining competitive and keeping these teams in the championship for as long as possible is probably, is probably huge. And I believe you're a big advocate of the tackle and putting a lot of uh, time into the tackle. It would if is the tackle is your word almost, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Closing down space, getting hands on, yeah, all that sort of stuff is. Uh, well, look, turnovers in the modern game. No, look, always it was great to get turnovers, but now it's where defend or where you know where defenses are, are at their most weakest is when they think they're in control of the ball, and if you can turn it over and go a pace attack. When that space is available, that's you know that's dynamite. That's where you get huge scores, big turnovers. Change, you know, it's it's moments and games that change it for the better for your own team. So, if 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 you're not in there making those tackles, you won't get the ball back. So that that's where I'd be. Yeah, I get a bit mad on that from time to time, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's obviously one word that I don't even know if you ever heard the word turnover mentioned in a dressing room uh, when you were, when you were playing. I don't, I don't even know if it was a thing. And I'm wondering, what do you think of football as a spectacle now, maybe compared to during your own playing days? I think some of the innocence maybe has gone out of it, but what do you think of it as a spectacle now? As a spectacle, it probably isn't as good to watch. Definitely for, we'll say, your average lay person that's tuning in every now and again. They're not down in the field every night looking at what's going on in training or or being, you know, a mentor of some sort. Uh, I can see where, yeah, the the, the curb appeal mightn't be um, as good as it used to be. Um, but in saying that, the skill set that these lads have now. It mightn't be as flash, but they're absolutely top class. You know, what they're able to do, you know, it, nobody thinks twice of slipping onto their left or right anymore, right hand, left hand. It's just done automatically. It, it, so, and and the art of the tackle has come on a ton, you know, and referees are, are really, really, really efficient on the drag of the arm now where I used to get away with murder. You know, you'd half pull a lad. You know, as, as I used to tell you, half a foul is not a foul unless you're caught. But now I can't say that anymore. That's gone. It's, you know, good, clean strike on the ball. Hands out, clear the hands, show the referee, get it back in. It's, you know, it's just totally different than what we used to be able to get away with. But And that's that's the way it should be. The game should evolve. Has it is it starting to come back where it is a little bit more eye-catching? Definitely, if you were looking at Armagh and Donegal at the weekend, just gone past, you know, you'd say, wow, that was a serious first half anyway. Then our man just made Donegal come out and play and picked them off. And uh, and you know what? Totally professional job in the second half. But that first half was excellent to watch. Um, Galway try and play on the front foot uh, a lot. You know they they hit it with pace. 
Dublin are really, really, they, you know, they've been the standard bearers for so long. They like to play front foot football, you know, hit, hitting lines hard, moving ball quickly, and carry or carry. They always like to kick pass, and they, don't, they haven't overly gone away from that. They have adjusted, naturally enough. But So I think, you know, these things evolve and come back. It's, it's probably the, the, the lesser teams that, that we don't see so much that are maybe be trying to make sure they don't get beaten by much, get a really, really sound defensive structure that, yeah, that can be hard to watch. And the initial part of the championship can be a little bit boring. But I bet you if you go back through when we were playing in the 90s, it was, there was a lot of the similar stuff. Like uh, I know in 97, we, we drew Westmead in Tullamore in the worst game of all time. And was, we were I, I, was, I was at it eight points apiece. It was the yeah. worst game of football I've ever seen. Yeah. And I've seen some bad football. It was brutal. Oh, and there was nothing like it wasn't the, the weather that caused it. It wasn't anything that you could say. You could, there was no excuses. It was just terrible. So, it, like, there's always been terrible games. So, in, you know, so, but the, the coverage everything gets now, you know, you have GA Go, TG Car, Sky, RTE, the amount of games that you get to see now just surpasses that that was on the go then. And you didn't see an awful lot of the the shocking games, unless you were an avid fan and you were there. And at that point, you were stuck in it anyway. And it was only afterwards you might have meant, oh, that was terrible. But, you know, not not half the countries, you know, they didn't see it. Yeah, all eyes are on everything now. Uh, seeing as you, you brought up 97, we might just spin back to it. It's, it's 25 years this year. Um, just for maybe some of our younger our younger viewers might know exactly, like Offaly came from Division 4 to win Leinster that year, which would be... Like that would be totally unheard of, I'd say now anyway, particularly with du- with Dublin's dominance. Can you just talk to me about obviously Tommy Lyons coming in, um, his training methods? I'd say didn't agree didn't agree with some maybe, and the famous neutron diet that was put in place maybe didn't didn't agree with some as well. But can you just talk to me about about Tommy coming in and how he probably maybe changed the mindset and the ethos amongst the squad back then? Because going from division like basically without being smart, you're going from no hopers to the Leinster champions, that, and that's the way it was. Yeah, definitely. Well, I was there the year before, so I made my debut for Offaly in, in 96 and uh, played loud in the first round and ended up uh, about midway through the second half heading for, for Navin Hospital. So <laughs> I got absolutely creamed, uh, broke my collarbone. Uh, so then Tommy came in and he he was installed good and early. The, the, the championship in 96, wasn't finished. And uh, we had a meeting over in Edenderry. 50, 55 lads were called in to the meeting. And Tommy said, I would stall. Um, he just said, look, lads, this is not going to be for everyone. And what we have to do right now is look around the room. And he, he, he was fairly blunt. He said, we'll have to, we're not fit to train even yet. So we have to get you fit enough to train properly. And from there on, um, yeah, it was dogging sessions. Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, we we he put us through he put us through the mill, but it it was probably what we needed, and we had no comprehension of what real fitness was until until he got us there. To be honest, some of us did. Now, Benny Claffey was a Rolls Royce. Mackey was a Rolls Royce. You know, Rona Mooney was a Rolls Royce. Sean Grennan would just wouldn't give up. It's just pure pure. You know, I wouldn't say thickness, but it, just determination. He just, you know, he wouldn't, he just, he always find more somewhere. That, that was Sean, and that's why he was the great leader he was with us. Finn Barcullen, another man, just would not give in. Huge engine. So there was a handful of lads, but then there was then there was the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I put you in the category of the rest of us now, but talk to me, talk me through this neutron diet. It was like it was spreading like wildfire around the country about what you were doing or what you were eating or what you weren't eating. Can you just talk me through that? Yeah, so actually I wasn't on it. I was the only one on the panel that, that wasn't on the neutron diet. I, I was in Templemore at the time, so there was a, yeah, I but and and as well as that, uh, I was a I wasn't even eleven stone, I think. Yeah. So I was he was he was he was hoping, Yeah, he was hoping I would bulk up a small bit. Um Particularly after, yeah, because after what he's seen, <laughs> what he's seen initially, and and going off half killed in, in ninety six against Lau, but uh, yeah, you, they, they they took a blood sample, sent it off for analysis, and it came back with a list of foods you could eat. So some of the lads came back with mad stuff like rabbit, 
and but you could but the same fella could could drink cider you know and, and then most of us couldn't drink anything you know it was just you know alcohol was out it, it, so it kind of was funny but it, it just made you it brought you to that point where you were thinking about what you're eating even if it wasn't what was on that very very specific plan but you were thinking about what you're eating you were thinking about what you're putting into your body and and as Tommy used to say, lads, white bread is poison. So that was it. You know, like, so straight away, if you were cutting out that sort of white bread, you know, chippers, you name it, sure, look, you were on a winner straight away. And the training we were doing uh, allied to that, like lads just, you know, weight just fell off, lads. Um, and as a result, then we were flying at matches. And like what people forget sometimes about that 97 team was I had a Leinster medal in my arse pocket and a heap of, you know, there was six or seven of us or even eight or nine of us even on that panel. You had Sean Grennan, Fenber Cullen and the boys, they had played in an All-Ireland minor final. And then you had under-21 under, under 21 lads like Tom Coff, Phil Riley, Vinnie Claffey, Peter Brady played in an All-Ireland under-21 final and the boys won one. So he wasn't coming into a dressing room with lads that, you know, were used to getting beaten out the gate at underage level. We, were, we all had some sort of a medal in our arse pockets. So... You couldn't accuse Tommy of being silly where he, he pitched up either because there was talent there. It just needed to be harnessed properly. And in fairness to him and Paula Kelly and Eddie Fleming and Jim Quinlan, the doc, all the boys, you know, it was just professional from the get go. No excuses. Let's work. And that's, and that's, and you know what? You put it in. Sometimes you get it out if you have the talent. And we had a bit of that in fairness. Uh those methods um, allied to the talent, as you say, you, you must have felt like you like kind of been turned inside out. Tom Coffey is the one that, stand, that stands out to me. Like Tom looked a completely different man on the pitch than maybe compared to other years. You must have felt, uh, like it's almost like subconsciously you're sticking your chest out because you feel like you have so much work done and you feel in such a good place physically. And obviously he, worked, he would have worked on you mentally as well. But you must have felt like you were in an unbelievable place. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, and everything was incremental. Like we 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 fairly breezed through Division Four, and um, we had a good old tough game against Sligo uh, in Tullamore, but we still won by five or six points. And the you know the same with the first game out in down in Tipperary. Actually, there was a gang of us standing up in in our clothes. We weren't even tugged out for that game, you know, because there was fifty of us initially brought in. So. Um, and, and again, that was testing your metal all the time. Like, there's nothing as bad as heading off down to somewhere. <clears throat> you don't even have a gear bag with you. You know, you're just going there to watch a match and everyone had to go. You know, there was no, well, I'm not part of the squad today, so I can stay at home. Everyone had to go. Um, so, so there was always those little tests that Tommy was throwing at you. But yeah, yeah, no, uh, as it went along, we got better and better and the confidence started to flow. Um yeah, we got to yeah yeah no we got to league quarter final against Kildare and then nipped us just maybe being clever you know more experienced so they 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 clipped us there in Avon but it didn't feel like a bad beating you know it felt like we learned a lot from it <clears throat> excuse me so so yeah we never really had anything to check our upward trajectory uh, until the All Ireland semi final really. Yeah, talk to just talk to me. Just wheeling back uh, one game to that Leinster Leinster final, like that was that was a bit of a whirlwind. I know Mead were down a few bodies. I think they'd had the three games to get over Kildare in the semi final. I think uh, Martin O'Connell was missing. He was a late absentee on the day of the game, but that that was just so memorable. Right, rise two goals. Every everything about it. It's just um, they were reigning all Ireland champions, and here you have these, these boys coming from Division Four rocking up and just producing an unbelievable uh, Leinster final performance. Yeah, um, well, look, we were waiting in the wings. Kildare and Mead knocked the stuffing out of each other. And then there was, yeah, there was Mead had a few discipline issues. Uh, a couple of lads were sent off. Yeah, I think, yeah, Mark Riley. Um, uh, who else was gone? Yeah, there was a couple. There was two, two or three of them gone anyway. But that it kind of, we weren't really concerned about that. That didn't bother. Like, we weren't looking at them at all it was all internal what we were doing like training for the six or seven weeks nearly between the semi-finals uh tommy up the ante all along and by the time we it came to me we were knocking the heads off each other like it was just you know we were ready to roll so you know going out that day I, we we felt we were going to win 
Um, I don't know where that exact confidence comes from, but we did feel, look, these boys in, you know, if we bring what we can bring, they won't live with us today. And luckily enough, that's the way it panned out. Roy had one of those days. Vinny was unreal. And uh, yeah, the rest is history in that one. Just talk to me about this. I don't know if you can see this, Carl, from back in the day. Uh, <laughs> there hasn't been too many footballers that have worn shin guards. Talk, talk, me, talk me through that. I'm going to get some slagging now. Uh, yeah, no, look, when I start now playing senior football with Tullamore, I played a good bit of soccer, underage soccer, uh, for Tullamore as a young fella. And I loved playing soccer. It was great, Ken. But I was playing for Tullamore in the first, yeah, first my first year senior, and a lad foot blocked me. And I got a nasty ankle injury as a result. And I, and I said, sure, look, I'm here. I'm used to wearing shin guards, wear them all the time playing soccer. So I just threw them on. And after that, then I don't think I was ever foot blocked again, but it just became habit. It was like one of those things, you know, Nick socks, shin guards, gloves. I always wore gloves no matter what the weather was too, because I wasn't the best man to catch ball that was around. So any, any advantage I could get, I'd take. I didn't mind. Uh, so yeah, no, it just became a habit thing. So uh, I hated not having it then because it just didn't seem right. Yeah, I don't know if there's been anyone since, to be honest with you. It's not, I, I remember wearing them once playing football for some reason. And whatever way, when they threw up the ball and it used to come down, it would end up hitting the bottom, bottom of the shin guard. But listen, it was OK. You didn't kick the ball too much, so you kind of didn't have to worry about that too much. Oh, yeah, hand pass merchant, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, sure, look, that, that's it, though. Cornerback back then, it, you know, you see the lads now and they've licensed to go. You know, Lee Pearson, he's gone like a bullet. He, he, you're looking up... <laughs> Why is he up there? Never mind. You know, how did he get up there? You know, so they have license to go now with, with defensive structures now, the way, you know, if there's enough back and you're told to go on, you, you have license to bomb back in our day. To be honest, two man full forward lines were all the rage. So I had a little bit of speed. So I was always kind of back there. Let it be Ollie Murphy or Tommy Dowd or whoever it was. I'd be one of the two anyway, left back in the full back line. Uh, so when you got it, then it was the tendency to yeah move it on quick and pass. John Kenny was a great man. He always showed for ball. He he was he, he wanted ball all the time. So uh, I was on the same side of, uh, as John. So he was a great man. To, uh, anytime he looked up, he was coming free. So it was an easy job. Pop it on to the man that's free. If you don't have it, you can't do anything wrong with it. As, as you were saying there, uh, Carl, you were designated man marker a lot of the time, picking up the most dangerous forward. And I'm just wondering, throughout your own playing career, who was the goat? Who was the, the hardest player to mark or the best player you've ever seen or shared a football pitch with? For me, so I would have struggled with the more powerful lads. Um, you know, if he if was my size and, you know, in around same pace wise, I didn't mind that. You know, you, 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 you'd fight your own corner. But Tony Boyle from Donegal, one year, we played, we played in, in 1998, we played a league quarter final against him. And I didn't start on him, but I went across onto him after a few minutes. Um, and I won the first three balls. And I'm thinking, geez, you know, this is great. I'm flying it here, the you know, Tony Boyle, because I had played Rabia Cup against him as well. Uh, didn't mark him now. He was full forward in that Rabia Cup match. But uh, I remember watching him and Darren Fay. It was like I was a spectator. I was playing cornerback, and the two of them went at it, hammer and tongs. And it was a huge eye-opener for me. As much as, at this stage, won the Leinster final, you know, played really high level, all Ireland semi-final. But to see the two boys go at it, you're kind of going, I'm not that. I'm Physically, I'm not that level. So anyway, getting back to 1998 uh, against Donegal, um, yeah, won the first three balls, thinking everything was going great, and he kicked three points off me in the second half, and I didn't lay a glove on him. I mean, he just totally changed tack and just started swinging balls over the bar from everywhere, and I'm going, wow, you know, that's that's top class player. He just changed what he was doing, and yeah, he skinned me. So it was kind of yeah, it was big learning, but it was the more powerful lads that I would have struggled with. But yeah, I always. If if I'm asked it, if I'm asked after a few pints, it's always uh, that's Tony Boyle for me. Tony Boyle is the goal. We have Eamon O'Hara waiting in the wings, so I'm just going to get a quick verdict, uh, Carl, on the the semi final. It's it's I, it's probably not quite fifty fifty. The balance is ever so slightly favoured in Westmead's favour, maybe just a tiny bit. But how how do you see it going? It is a, it's a great opportunity for both. It's obviously a televised game uh, on Sunday and a great opportunity to get back to Crow Park for both. But how do you see it going in the wind up? 
I see it as being very tight and um, my heart says awfully, but the head said that maybe Westmead have a little bit little bit more on the tank. They don't they don't seem to have suffered as many injuries. Um so it, and I don't like yeah, yeah, did actually do you know what I should have thought about this before I came on to you. But, I'm going, to, hey, I'm going to go with the heart. <laughs> I, I, I hope awfully by two or three points, but it's going to be really, really tough. Yeah, it should be a better of a game. It, yeah. it might be a bit lost in Crow Park is, is the is the only fear, as you say, if it was yeah. in a provincial venue, in even in Mullingar or in Tullamore or Port Leash or something like that, there would probably be a greater atmosphere around it. But uh, hopefully hopefully we'll be preparing for uh, a Talchin Cup final with a bit of luck. Cottle, thanks a million for, for joining us today. No really problem. appreciate it. Good man. Thanks, Cheers, man. Michael. Good man, just going to bring in Eamon O'Hara here. Eamon, how are you? Mick, how are you doing, pal? Very good, very good. Um, obviously, we're just chatting cottle there about the other side of of the Talchin Cup semi finals. You're 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 in uh, the you're in the other half with with Cavan. Obviously, uh, it's gone it's gone nicely for Sligo, considering it was probably a disappointing exit to to Roscommon in the Connacht Championship. Uh, two absolute belters of games against London. And obviously, it's always nice to beat uh, beat your Connacht rivals, Leitrim, and it was fairly dramatic the way he did it. But as I say, it's kind of resembles Offaly as well. Like if in previous years, Sligo's summer would have been long over, and in the last two years, they only played one championship game. This will be their fifth on Sunday. It probably shows the benefits of the Talchin Cup already. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And it was always going to be that was going to be the argument that that anyone's going to say you'll get a run of games if you find a little bit of form within the Talton Cup. Um, I suppose at the start of it, I was very, very much against it. I suppose for reasons of that, I think you always want to view yourself being a little bit better than what you are. You need to perform a little bit better and you need to be trying to operate at the high levels. But, you know, when you sit down and look at it logically and, and the benefit that you get from playing games on a regular basis, albeit they're of your level, um, it doesn't make you a better team is the, is the big question. I always found at times when you're a lesser team when you come up against a good football and team you end up raising your standards and everything becomes better as a result of that but when you're playing something on your own level you know you get an extra second or two on the ball you're in, you have time to make a mistake and it's not punished and i think you can fall into a false sense of where you actually are despite you actually winning so um but saying all of that uh, it's games and it's you're still in the championship and yeah, the lads, I suppose, Sligo went over to New York, struggled big time over there, and then came back and was coming, so really sort of, you know, pummeled them really in second gear. And, you know, taking a heavy bang like that, it's always going to be sort of create those doubts. And with Tata Cup coming and looming down, you didn't really know what was going to be. And we were lucky we got uh, London in the first round. And, you know, that was a challenge. You know, an unorganised London team with the, with the greatest of respect that came over on three different flights. So you can imagine that... They were a little bit scattered coming to Sligo, but at the same time, they were probably looking at it and saying, you know, we got turned over by, by uh, Leitrim in the Championship. This is a really good chance for us to progress. And they really came with their guns blazing and Sligo needed to be on their game. And they were pinned to the back of their collar throughout. And we were lucky to get to get out of Marathon Park with a, with a result. And then obviously the Leitrim game always brought down a bit of, you know, rivalry. Uh, we played each other many a time at both League and Championship. And I suppose there's lots of familiarity there, but... You know, the lads got the job done. Uh, probably allowed Leitrim to come back into it. Leitrim had a brilliant start. And they, they down tools. You could see their intensity drop and I thought it was probably easy. And then you can see Sligo coming back and went on a massive run. And we were lucky that the likes of Paddy O'Connor, um, Alan O'Reilly were outstanding. Sean Caraval, as normal, was outstanding on the day. And, you know, we, uh, you know, despite Keith Byrne um, scoring one seven one eight, I think it was, Evan Lyons, Young lads from Sean McHale's did really, really well on him. So Sligo found uh, form, and without Michael Murphy as well, I think that was a real bonus that the likes of, of Riley and O'Connor now all of a sudden are stepping up. Um, you know, obviously, down to the years, funny enough, listening to Kyle there, and he was talking about different players that we played against, and we played each other so many times, and he's mentioned a lad with Paul Taylor. We had Paul Taylor at full forward for many a year. And he got injured, and then all of a sudden it gave an opportunity to like the Desi Sloan and Jerry Malone, my own club man, to flourish because more balls started going to them and they started presenting more and they took the responsibility on so much more. And it's almost like a carbon copy there with, with Michael, uh, or Niall Murphy not being there. Uh, um, Alan and, and uh, Paddy O'Connor in particular have really, really stepped up. And it's, it's great to see. It's great to see that these guys uh, are willing to take the responsibility. 
going into next weekend's game is going to be a different proposal. You're going into Crow Park and there's an expectation there and you're obviously going to be man-marked as well when you've got four or five points in the previous game you're going to be man-marked so it's how you overcome that your your audio is jumping a tiny bit Eamon so I might just give you a chance there just to, to see if you're able to fix it but just on you were mentioning Paddy O'Connor there interesting one about Paddy uh, Paddy and Eamon Kilgallen who are uh, club mates in St Farnans they were actually co-chairs of St. Farnan's last year, which I found brilliant. They both took on the chairperson role jointly and they both ended up starring as St. Farnan's won league and championship. And it was the first time they were in the intermediate in a while. I think Paddy was even man of the match and kicked seven points. And there was another, I think there was another three guys from the committee that were on the team. So they got a committee picture after and most people were in their jeans and their shirt and you had five lads in their jerseys as well. Just a, It's a really uh, unique story. I was just chatting him yesterday and he was just saying it gives you so much of a great appreciation of the work that goes on in clubs and counties behind the scene. And he said it, it definitely helped the two of them even on the pitch because you realise just how much... Yeah, just how much of a vested interest people have. Um, but I just thought it was a unique kind of a story and he's definitely flourished without Niall Murphy who... Came on against, uh, I think he came on against London, um, but he's got a hand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So his availability would be huge, Eamon, for the weekend, wouldn't it? Like even yeah. even in any capacity. In any capacity, you know, he 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 get into any team. Like in all fairness, I think he's got that ability. He's got that bit of class. His ability to win his own ball, and you know, he just got he can score from anywhere. So he would be a key player to have. Unfortunately, I think he's still out. Um, I, you know, he, he was 50-50 probably going into that um, London game and then obviously came on, went down, sort of was, he had got a ball and, and lost it. And as soon as he bent down to pick it up, you can see his hamstrings sort of go again on him. So it's one of those type of ones that it might feel great after a week or two and then all of a sudden you went to the high intensity stuff and with adrenaline flowing through your body and that first ball coming to you, then you really, really know what it is. And fortunately for him, it didn't happen. So, uh, but listen, there's the, the, there's enough of quality there within in the team. I think they can really put it up to Cavan. And but you're talking, it's, a, it's Cavan. You know, the 2020 Ulster champions. They've got a lot of quality within their team. They're playing a very, very good system, um, and they've a bit of a ruthlessness about them. You know, they've dispatched a couple of teams so far. So you can see that. They would be very disappointed with their Ulster campaign, obviously dropping down to Division 4 and obviously subsequently being promoted again. Um, the game against Sligo in the league, you can look at it, but you can make comparisons to, we'll, we'll, we'll use Mayo and Kerry, for example. Kerry bet Mayo by a point in the league and then the National League final annihilated them. And, yeah. you know, Cavan had a slow start to the league, struggled early on and then really found their form and have maintained that sort of form right the way through since and obviously it didn't happen for them against against Donegal and Ulster but they've sort of really found their feet and if they're I suppose if they believe no more than Sligo if you're going to get up with the big boys you need to get out of Division 3 or up there and get into an Ulster final or ultimately win the Talton Cup uh, Aaron, it would be fair to say there's been a big emphasis on youth within the, the current kind of Sligo senior squad. And, you know, Paddy was saying at 24, he's probably one of the older guys. And I think the thing that he said that impressed the most about the management team was the long-term view that they were taking to everything. Long, uh, the management team, the backroom team, S&C, everything was, they're not trying to get, you know, up three levels now within six months. It's more of a kind of incremental kind of gains. Uh, and with the Connacht under twenty success, which you I know you were involved in, um, with your with your former teammate uh, Desi Sline, uh, things are think that the wheel is turning kind of nicely in Sligo. It doesn't happen very quickly, but it's turning kind of it's it is turning, even though on the outside maybe it mightn't look as obvious as maybe it does to people within Sligo. Yeah, it's it's a good point, and even listening, you know, when you listen to Carl there, and he was talking back about their under twenties or under 21s at the time winning an All-Ireland and they're playing in a minor All-Ireland, you know, when you've got a little bit of success at underage and that starts creeping back into your senior setup, you need to have a very, very good senior setup as well because you cannot expect these young fellas to carry the can and I think that's the most difficult aspect and I think with Sligo, I don't know what the, the message that's happened within Sligo at, at, at management level. I, I'm aware of the strength and conditioning because Sean Boyle was in there with them. He's actually was overlapping with the under 20s as well this year. Um, uh, our under 20s are very very well Desi invited me in this year he'd been there for the last uh, this is, it would have been three years with them this year and you know he's done a lot of work he's also um, 
been involved with club football within Sligo, so he'd know both sides of the senior side of it and, the, and the young guys coming through in the more than myself. I was with my own club, Torres Strand. So there was an overlap there who knew what was in the what was in the county, you were seeing it. And uh, you know, I was just trying to get that sort of self-belief and, and that willingness and that want to win within the group. In fairness to Paul Henry from Curry, he was the minor manager last year, or two years ago, I think it was now, and he won Connor. Or last, sorry, it was last year, he won Connor. So we have a minor title, we also have another 20 title. So those guys coming through now don't carry the scars that I, myself, or Desi, or other lads have played, because we've been humiliated and hammered by Mayo at underage, or Galway, or Roscommon at underage level. So these fellas don't. There's no inhibitions there whatsoever. So their self-belief in themselves, and they know they can play anyone in college, and they can beat them on any given day. And it's important that they move into a a senior setup that is a nurturing, that is uh, willing to develop. And I think that's the most important thing, Michael, is that there's a nurturing aspect. You cannot put any sort of heavy weight on these guys, even though they're. I think some of them are well capable of carrying it, knowing what they know. But I just think it just needs to be nurtured, and it's important that the that the senior guys embrace them and sort of bring them together. And then obviously. You know, create that sort of self belief, and I think that's the most important thing at senior level is to create that self belief. And Paddy has probably been through it the last number of years, but it's been tough for him. I know um, they've been in Division Four for the last two years trying to get out of it, and it is a hard, it's a hard graft to get out of there. And you need to decide you open all your eggs in one basket to get out of Division Four. Obviously, momentum will help you there in the, uh, when you go move on then into this, into the champions side of the championship side of it. But you don't necessarily, you may be running out of gas at that point because you need to really emphasise on driving to get out of Division 4. And I think I think that's something that needs to be looked at within Sligo because we can get our guys playing against the quality that's up in Division 3 and, and, and ultimately hopefully in Division 2. I think then they can really, really flourish and really understand what it takes to be a, a county footballer. Just jumping back um, to your own career, because I just think I think it's interesting something you said there. I'd say there's a lot of clubs uh, and even a lot of counties that are, maybe haven't had any underage success, haven't won a minor, haven't maybe even contested finals uh, and under 20 or under 21 finals. But your squad wouldn't have had, uh, you would have had very little success in it. So how how did you break that boundary of, OK, we've been beaten by Sly, or we've been beaten by Mayo and Galway the whole way up. How did he uh, get the resolve to turn, be able to turn that around at senior level as well as he did at times? Uh, it's a very good question, Mike. I think um, back in, off, I started, obviously started in 93, 94. There was, a, there was a young group of us that was being brought in, Lord Red, Johnny Stenson, a former um, a Sligo player from Curry, and, and Mick Laffey. His son, Peter, is actually currently on the, on the senior team at this present moment in time playing midfield. Mick and Johnny came together in 93, 94, and, invited a raft of us in and we'd been part of an under 20 even though I was 18 we were part of an under 21 team that uh, got to two Connick finals in, and ended up in two replays against Mayo who subsequently went on to win an All-Ireland and contested another one. but we bet Galway in that lead up to it that was a, a Jaff Allen led Galway team that had won the minor in 93 All-Ireland minor so they were expected to go on and dominate sort of for, for a period of time which ultimately did in subsequent years at senior level but um we bet that group, so we got a little bit of taste of what it took, um, and then they just threw huge faith in us. And it goes back to my point, which I was previously saying, Michael, that you know there was a lot of weight put on us. We were brought into a senior team and we were expected to perform because we were the young guys coming in, and obviously a lot of the senior lads that had been established from the previous years. Obviously, they were at an older age; they were sort of dropped from the setup. So there was an amalgamation of both. And Bernard Kilcoyne, Tommy Brenny. And my own brother and all, they were all part of that senior lad and they had just embraced and brought us in together and you know we kind of gelled and obviously PJ Carroll came in you talk about the fitness and you talk about yeah, um, Carl was talking about Tommy Lyons and the fitness work and the diets that we went on, there's no diets, we just ran, we literally just ran every night in trouble curry, mile after mile after mile and uh, we won so many games, we got, we got promoted out of Division 4 twice actually, we went up and came back down again but the effort that we put into it was we won games with 10 minutes to go. That was it. We would just stay in the fight for the last 10 minutes and then our fitness would take over and that's ultimately what it was. So, you know, that's where we built from and obviously Mickey Moore then came in and we really finessed the, the fitness side of it with football and that's where we became more and more competitive and we played against Galway a couple of times. They went on to win the All-Ireland. You know, the, the problem was we were playing my own Galway. We were able to handle Roscommon. There was always tit for tat, and down to the years, there was always some brilliant games against Roscommon. But with my own goal, was that we would just we'd get close and we could really, really push them. And 
but they were always going up contesting all Ireland finals. So we were kind of getting a bit of an insight saying we're not far away, but we're we're still you know lacking in terms of being a a county player for twelve months of the year, if you know what I mean. That mindset. Yeah. So it was just then Forty came in, he brought in a different type of confidence and self belief, and um, you know obviously that back then when we when we bet our own and then got to the quarterfinals and you know we could have should have. If, if we'd taken our chances against our man, they went on to win. And that was a great era back then. It was Galway where they were the all one champions and we played them in the Connacht final. And that is my point was a game we should have won. We played, we bet Tyrone, who subsequently were the all three champions. And obviously we were up drawn with our man, who were the all two champions. So we were in the mix with this quality. We were getting real insights. But unfortunately, we were always an injury or two away, Mick. You know, once we lost yeah. one bit of quality, we didn't have the replacement to come in and that was it. And, Few lads got injured, and we just then all of a sudden we started to slide down. And you know, from being the heights of 02, funny enough, you go back to 04, uh, and which we were talking about the Talton Cup, Tommy Murphy Cup was in, and uh, I was completely against it because even though our secretary at the time was really very much promoting it, I just didn't want it because I said, if we're going to be ambitious, we're going to be. If we're going to have a sort of an attitude that we're, we have to view ourselves differently, we cannot be looked at as Sligo as this weaker team. We have to sort of internally within in the county to say, let's drive our standards a little bit higher, not stepping back into a lesser competition. And that's where there was a, we had a team vote and there was a bit of a, a, bit of a clash of, of individuals and, and uh, they ended up, Sligo going up, brought up a team up. Uh, I think it was managed by Paul Dirk at the time against Antrim and they were well beaten against Antrim in, the, in, in Crow Park. But the, the message was, um, you know, it's great to get a game. It was great to get a game uh, in Crow Park, but it was really a humiliation more so than anything else. Then subsequently, we, we ended up winning in 07, a kind of title in 07, and, you know, built from there. And then uh, Kevin Walsh came in for five years, and we, we really should have won two county uh, kind of titles in that era because we had a really, really good squad of players, but it wasn't to be. Uh, just, you say you were kind of against the Tommy Murphy Cup. What were your initial thoughts on the Talchin Cup? Um, and have, have, yeah, against it as well, yeah. Yeah, I to, yeah because I was always like, you know, who gives anyone a God given right to go for, for, for uh, uh, Sam Maguire? And, you know, I was, we were in a, a group with a lot of lads that would be at different teams, at, at different ranges of friends. And I asked them the question I said, lads, why don't we leave Sam Maguire for the Division 3, Division 4 teams, i.e., the Talton Cup, and we'll make a Super League? And the answer to me was, why would, why would, should Sam Maguire is the, is the ultimate prize? And I said, exactly. I said, you view it as the ultimate prize, but I view it, like all the other weaker teams, as the ultimate prize as well. You can, you, I get the intermediate and junior and all at that level, and I completely understand it, but I just says, to be able to play for it, now we have to earn it. You just have to accept it. Once it comes in, you have to accept it. And I think it has definitely, it has helped both sides of the group, because obviously when you look at the qualifiers now, there's been no, you know, the last four, what you see here, you could have one of the, you could have a cavern in the mix here today, you know, next weekend, if it was Derry or Clare or Marigal, they could have been in that mix if there was if there was no talent in cup because of the opportunity of the qualifiers. But you know, that's the way it works out. There's two sides now. You gotta just fight to get out of division four, get into division three, and then obviously fight to get out of that as well. Fight to get into a, a, um, a provincial final or ultimately win the competition and you're the right then to compete against the big boys. Yeah, hundred percent. Um just wheeling back to that Connacht under twenty success. I'd imagine there was some outpouring of emotion around that, just because, uh, as as uh, Tommy Brown, he said to me before the All Ireland semi final, there's never been uh, a Sligo under twenty winner in the history. You know, never before. There's never been someone with a chance to play in an under twenty All Ireland even for Sligo. So I'd imagine, and even just uh, yeah, the emotion around it all, the circumstances of the the game and how it finished. I'd imagine it was an unbelievable scene. It was. It was brilliant. Um... Honestly, I probably fell out of love with Sligo football a little bit, um, just a little bit disillusioned with it, the way it was going. And I got a call from uh, my very good friend, Richard Kennedy, who'd been involved with Desi for the three years. And obviously, myself and Desi got on very, very well. And, but Desi had been there working really, really hard for the two years. And um, he just gave me a call last October and, you know, kind of sort of just tweaked something. And I said, you know, something, I'd give it a go. And at this point, I'd actually had committed to Mohol uh, in Leitrim as, a, as their senior manager as well. And uh, so then all of a sudden, it was a bit of an overlap. But, you know, obviously, you, you, you juggle that. And uh, But once I got in and got to know the lads and saw them training and got to know them as 
as boys and some of them as men because some of them were only doing their leaving cert and some of them were in college. So there was, there was a huge difference of, of uh, emotions and maturity and everything else. But they grew up for that five, six months. Really, really, uh, it just was amazing to see it uh, up close. And obviously, you know, we had huge help. Desi had a very good backroom team. Paul Higgins with the, with the football coach from Shamrock Gales. And obviously, Richard and Pendle Kennedy were in there. Connemara had been established there for the last number of years where I actually played with Sligo as well. And then we had a very, very good just sort of uh, further out uh, uh, backroom team that you know we all came together and it was one unit we just our focus was to win a Connacht title and Roscommon had bet them last year and Desi was very very disappointed and you know our focus and once the draw was made it was Roscommon let's we're going to beat Roscommon and then ultimately we did and obviously then the next step was a week later to Mayo and at times the game was kind of going away from us but we always felt we had a chance knowing that what Leacham had done with them uh, they put in a couple of high balls um, in desperation and there was a few questions around that and we actually skirted around that idea would we use a big target man pop in a few high balls see what would happen and um, but ultimately it came down to Jack Lavin our captain he was fantastic he just uh, you know put a ball into the mix and it just carried the way through Brian Burns from Curry. his best friend unfortunately was was Red Oak, who had, who had passed away at the time. And, you know, those Curry lads had worked so hard emotionally and physically to, to get them back into the mindset. And Burns had really, really flourished for those three or four weeks leading up into the Roscommon and, and, and ultimately the Connacht final. And uh, we just said, you know, he's six foot two, let's put him in there on the edge of the square. And full nuisance value. And he, he, he says to this day, he's probably trying to claim that flick on as a goal, but he didn't get his hand in it. It was all jacks. And, uh, you know, just... Just the emotion was amazing, I suppose. I, from this, the third goal that we got, I ended up pulling my calf. I don't know how. I just, just reacted. <laughs> really? <laughs> Absolutely blew us. I never had an injury. I thought somebody had hit me with a bottle and I was looking around and, said, Who's? and then I realised it was my calf. So I, I couldn't run across the field. I had to hobble my way over. But it was just brilliant. I, just to see people coming out and it reminded me of 2007 and, you know, when we really, really... Um, that success and there was a hunger for success and I think there's an awful lot of Sligo people started to get belief in this group you know there was a real sort of sense of 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 um, confidence within the group that we could make something happen and you know thankfully it did uh, unfortunately we didn't live up to the to the to the expectations in the in the semi-final against Kildare we were bet by a really good Kildare team on the day we we had one chance we just didn't take it and you know, the work that was being done, Kyle Sheridan got in as a sports uh, sports uh, performance analysis. He was outstanding for us as well. And the, the guys just bought into everything. They really, really did. And they were very self-critical, but at the same time, they were being respectful to each other. And it was it was just a lovely environment to be in for those couple of months. It's gas to say you're probably thinking about injuries for an hour in semi-final. You didn't think your, your coach or yourself would be yeah. injured, but you listen. Um, Hurried around from pub to pub. That's what I was for afterwards. But anyway. You had plenty of access to ice anyway, but I'd say it was in a, in a large bottle now, more than more than on your calf, I'd say, somehow. Uh, um, just look, looking at the weekend, Damon, uh, it is a, a tough task, obviously. What are we talking about? About 18, 19 months ago, Cavan were winning an Ulster title. Um, and they're obviously, they were both obviously played in Division 4 uh, this year in the league, but, you know, Cavan's farm at different stages over the last couple of years is, you know, they hit a very, very high ceiling. Even in the All Ireland semi final against Dublin that year, they were quite competitive. So, a tough, a tough task for Sligo this weekend. It is a tough task, uh, but an achievable one. Uh, I think if you were to look at the form side of it, obviously Sligo struggled badly against Leitrim and London in terms of the performances. Within those performances, they also had a time to dominate the game and they could have kicked on to win. You know, handsomely, if they really, really wanted to, or if they had the know-how to do it, and I think that's where Slide was kind of just breaking down. It's to control the game at the right time. Um, they showed really, really good um, passages of football, a bit like Cavan, really good passages of football, but then huge naivety on the other side of it as well. So, obviously, they're still in the learning curve. But like you know, we're, we're two weeks, two years into Tony McIntyre, they should know this by now how to sort of manage games. On the flip side of that, Cavan are coming up. They've got, you know, get the, 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 you can talk around the the, the, the the individual battles that will be out there, but when you've got Galligan at midfield, you've got um, McKiernan, just those powerful ball winners around the midfield, and then you've got runners coming through. If, you're, if Sligo don't dominate that midfield area or come out 50-50, we will struggle really, really badly. 
Obviously, on the flip side of that, they'll have guys that are going to man mark the likes of Paddy O'Connor, the likes of, of Alan O'Reilly as well. So, you know, where is it? Where are we going to get our sort of uh, uh, an outlier that's going to really come in and put up a, an eight or a nine out of ten performance? So that's the big challenge from there. Um, so for me, it'll be it'll be very, very much about Sligo staying in the game for the first, you know, obviously for the first 40, 45 minutes, and then hoping that they're in a position then to sort of try and kick on or throw caution to the wind. You know, um, I don't think we're well set up defensively to sort of just sit back and accept what Cavan are going to throw at us. They'll bring up their they'll bring they'll bring up their uh, goalkeeper um, Ray Gallagher to kick free if necessary. It's, they've got an array of talent, but on the flip side, what I just keep saying, Sligo. They can perform. I think it's they've been playing within themselves as individuals for the last while. I think if they can come out and just go for it and be brave, be smart, I think they will be. Uh, they can take it right down to the wire. But I just think you might you put your analysis hat on. You just would have to give the nod to Kevin on it. You mentioned about being disillusioned maybe before coming into the under twenty setup with Sligo football. Uh, has that has that kind of a thought process turned around a bit now, having been in there and seeing what's going on? Um, I, I've seen it. I, I was very, very much focused on the under twenty, and I think it's all about unity and about moving in the one direction. And I think the one thing was that I didn't have to come into the group of twenties and say, "Listen, lads, we need to go this way." It was already there, it was established, and it was lovely to come into that to see thirty-five, thirty-eight people going in the one direction and ignoring what was the noise outside that that bubble. And I think. Uh, no one was trying to be the hero or no, there was no ego, there was no one looking saying well it was all to do with me, it was all to do with this man or it was a collective effort from everybody big and small and I think the delusion is probably outside that and what direction we want to go as a as a county and the funny thing about it, we've won a minor title so there's obviously good work being done there we've won another 20 title, there's obviously good work there so I think it's an opportunity to really harness what's being done I mentioned after the minor title and I think Desi threw the line at me at the he just says, um, I just said it's important that Sligo County Board create a pathway for the minor team. And Desi said, well, if rather than being creating a pathway, why don't you be that pathway for this group of fellows coming in? And, you know, he kind of called my bluff and that's why I stepped into it was, you know, be part of the solution rather than the problem. And uh, and I was I was ultimately happy to do that. So I think outside it, there's a lot of work to be done. But I think internally with this group of lads, it's, it's nurturing them, really nurturing them. And I mean that by nurturing It's not about dictatorship or it's not about bullying it's about utter nurturing them and encourage them and develop them and and get them to understand why they're doing something and and uh, th these are smart fellows the one thing about them they understand but it's it's to understand what's the required step up now and and become a a county footballer 24 7 if you know wanting to use a term but at the same time find the work-life balance or the sport life balance uh, just, just briefly, I mean, I won't, I won't keep you much longer. But just looking at the All Ireland quarterfinals next weekend, where do you see the pecking order in, in football at the moment? Are do you see Kerry and Dublin a, a step ahead of everybody else, or how do you see that going into next weekend's uh, two sets of double headers? Um, obviously, they split two sides, one fairly well loaded, and one obviously with a new batch of a new batch. Obviously, you know, Dublin have come back really, really established themselves. I don't think they're at that point where they were previously, I don't think they have the impact of players coming in, but they've definitely found form and you have to admire them for that. You know, the hatchets were out to reach and every one of them there and Desi Fern has done a really, really good job just to re-energise the group. They seem to have got their time and right. Obviously they're going to have, you know, I won't be not being disingenuous to Cork. I've seen them against Limerick and at times they struggled against Limerick. So I think you'd expect Dublin to to really, really win that. And I don't think, unfortunately, being in Cork Park, not a whole lot of people will travel from that, from Cork up to watch that game. So, um, obviously, you're right in what you're saying. And Kerry, what are you going to get with Mayo is the big question, Mike. It's it's um, when, it, when chaos seems to arrive, Mayo seems to flourish. Uh, yeah. When desperation seems to come, Mayo seems to flourish. Uh, there's a huge expectation still there that there's a hangover from the all Ireland final. I think there's a lot of, you know, disappointed people still a little bit angry from last year's all Ireland final and they're annoyed that Mayo aren't in final the form they're annoyed with management they're annoyed every they're, they're looking for reason to be angry with them and this is Mayo people and you know I'm talking about so so they'll be sort of saying oh we've got Kerry again the attitude was when they were playing Kerry in the National League was it this this one doesn't really matter and then they subsequently got annihilated this one does really matter and uh you know, the big question is if they don't want to, you know, where does it leave this group of players? Where does it leave the management setup? Does it need to be freshened up? Does it need to be changed? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe these fellas just need a break.
they've been on the road and performing at the highest level for the last number of years. We have to give them a huge admiration for that. And maybe just six months off to come back to regroup, get the injuries right. All of a sudden, Mayo could bounce back and give the Mayo supporters another four or five years of huge on the on the edge of the seat excitement. So but I think, to call it, I think Kerry will probably shade this one. You just hope that Mayo don't get steamrolled. That me on the person side of it is that they be they don't deserve that as the team that have that have you know given us so many good days. On the other side, Mac always it's such, it's such a lovely one. It's like a it's like a it's like a birthday cake. It just has everything. It's uh, uh, you know the quality of players that Galway have, like Walsh, um, Comer, that powerful stuff, and then you flip sides and then you've got Ryan O'Neill. Uh, it's it's just it'll be class and it'll be such an atmosphere. Armagh will bring everyone down from Armagh and everywhere else to come and support them. The only thing I'd worry about with Armagh is that when they were the kind of favourites tag at the start of the championship to come in, to go down to De- or down to Donegal, I think it was in Valley Buffet, didn't perform. Then when that expectation went away from them, and people said, oh, what a disappointment. And then Derry took the spotlight off them. Armagh then all of a sudden popped their head up and played Tyrone. Now, that, I saw Tyrone up close. And I, I saw them against Derry and I was very, I thought there's something seriously wrong. They just didn't have that heart, that desire, that age that that they'd bring. It wasn't there at all. And then Armagh came and we thought they might have been a bit more local around them. And Armagh just you know, really blew them out of the water. And then obviously the game against Donegal was, you know, this was perfect for Armagh to come into it saying, you know, we have a great chance here. So I just think there's a bit of expectation on Armagh. It may weigh them down a small bit, but on the same side, if they play with their ability, and if Goa play with their ability, we're in for a ding dong battle. It could be the game, you know, it could be the game of the I won't say the, possibly of the decade if 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 both teams perform on it. So it's a tough one to call. I'm not going to call it to be quite honest with you. I just think it's it's just I just want to enjoy it, look at it and really, really enjoy it. And obviously Jerry and Claire, Claire, my my, my I mentioned him Jerry McGowan, he's, he's he's one of my best friends. He's he's involved with Claire with Colin Collins there and he's they've done a really, really good job. Colin's done a massive job. Jerry's there for the last two years. So um they were lucky. It looked like it was dead and buried against Ross Common, obviously you know yourself. So there's their brilliant side of their first half, they were outstanding, very controlled, just knew what everyone was doing. But then when Roscommon got on top, they just seemed to run out of ideas. And I think that's where they need to be against Derry, just stay in the game, be in control, some part of it. Maybe if it's just keeping the scoreboard down, but be in control of the game, that they're not letting them get in the way of them, that they're not being turned over and being punished on the flip side of it, that they're just in control of the game. I think that could go right down to the wire. Expectations on Derry now. All of a sudden, all the eyes are on them. And Rory Gallagher, listen, that Derry team have they've done so well. They've brought a freshness, freshness to our man or to Ulster. And there's, there seems to be a bit of a power shift coming around again, full circle. And our Derry and our man seem to be, you know, really, really coming again. So they're pushing the the, the more familiar teams that we've become accustomed to over the last few years to one side. So you know, um, that'll be a tight game. I think it's coming maybe tighter than what people expect. Yeah, there's some opportunity for each of those four teams there. There's an all Ireland final place oh, there if you're able to win two games. Um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for them. Eamon, I'll just leave you with this one. I asked Cotton the same question. Who is the uh, the GOAT, the greatest player you've ever played with or against throughout your own career? Oh, jeez. Um, I was lucky to be in an era of unbelievable players. Um, um, they're, like their folklore players because the, unfortunately to find the age I find myself at at this present moment in time Seamus Moynan was unbelievable Porrit Joyce was unbelievable Kieran McGeaney was unbelievable Kieran McDonald was unbelievable um, you, you pick out of those four lads now Michael and I'd have to get I'd have to get you I'd have to get you to pick one of them if you could if you could add one of them beside you with uh, Forgen for Sligo back in the day who would it have been I tell you, I put it this way: If we had Porrit Joyce in 2 we would have won an All Ireland. If we had Seamus Moynihan in 7 we would have got to an All Ireland semi final. So that's the way I look at it. <laughs> good man, good man. Yeah, good man, good man. Uh, with a bit of luck, Eamon, I'm an awfully man myself. So a bit of luck would be an awfully Sligo Italian Cup final. Here's here's hope, and anyway, but. Uh, Thanks a million for, for joining us today. I really, really appreciate no it. Good man. Enjoy the weekend, Michael. Take care, pal. Will do. Thanks a million. Good man. All the best. Um, obviously, some some great games to look forward to at the weekend. The two Touch Cup semi-finals. Great that they get 
uh, central billing on Sunday. As I said, I'm not so sure if Crow Park is the the ideal um, the ideal destination on Sunday because I think there's forecast around eight thousand people there. But the first uh, the inaugural running of the Tolkien Cup, so two really interesting semi finals, uh, Midlands Derby between Offaly and Westmead, and uh, the other semi finals is Sligo against the 2020 Ulster champions Cavan. Thanks, William, for joining us uh, today, folks. For more content, you can go to patreon.com forward slash our game only five euro per month loads of exclusive interviews monday's hurling show thursday show with kieran carey and richie power which kicks off at one o'clock today loads of match reaction on the day as well so thanks a million for joining us today folks really really appreciate it and we will see you again on monday for monday's show but looking back at a busy ga weekend thanks a minute